There is a film, Lost in Translation, which stars Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. This is my version and stars me and some mutant antibodies. The brief from the GAP Summit organisers to me was to give, I quote, a short presentation surrounding your own learnings throughout your career, translating research and interaction with industry, and advice for the leaders of tomorrow who are at the start of their own journey. I started off as an academic scientist employed by the UK Medical Research Council's Laboratory of Molecular Biology. I was one of the first to develop the use of protein engineering to analyse the structure and function of proteins, and in the early 1980s turned my attention to antibodies. Nearly 10 years earlier, César Milstein, also at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, had developed a method for making rodent monoclonal antibodies. These antibodies were able to target and kill specific cells, such as cancer cells, but in patients they were seen as foreign and raised an immune response. This led to human anti-mouse antibodies that blocked therapy. I wondered if we could use protein engineering to turn mouse antibodies into human, simply by transferring the antigen binding regions. The idea is shown schematically in the next slide. Antibodies are Y-shaped molecules. The antigen binding site is at the tips of the Y. Uh, the stem of the Y recruits antibody effector functions. Imagine we start with a mouse monoclonal antibody, which I've marked in red. We could imagine transferring uh, either just the antigen binding domains to a human antibody, which would give us an antibody that's two-thirds human, or just the antigen binding loops. This would give us an antibody that's about 95% human. Our initial results on a model antibody in vitro were promising. It seemed we could transfer the antigen binding activity in this manner. To cover the possibility of commercializing the technology, we filed patents on the humanizing technology. And so it was as an academic and now an inventor, I began my journey into the world of industry. But at that time, our work with antibodies in vitro hardly excited any interest from industry. But what really caught their attention was a clinical collaboration we had with a Cambridge colleague, Herman Waldman, to make a therapeutic antibody, the humanized antibody, CAMPATH-1. Herman had made a rat antibody that binds to both T and B cells. It binds to an antigen called CD52, and it kills both T and B cells in patients. But it raised a blocking immune response. By contrast, the humanized antibody we made together killed lymphocytes just as well as the rat antibody, but it didn't seem to be immunogenic. And in this slide, we can see its action over a period of uh, something like 30 days in destroying a very large mass of tumor from a patient who was otherwise terminal into, into in fact, a very small amount of tumor after, after 30 days. The industrial impact of this was immediate, and several companies wanted access to the technology. We had a patent, and we had the know-how, and now we had to deal with uh, how to license this patent. Should we sell the patent to one company and let them deal with the commercialization, or should we take it upon ourselves to license many companies? In the end, after some argument within the Medical Research Council, we decided to license many companies on a non-exclusive basis under easy terms. The aim was to encourage wide application and to avoid provoking challenges to the patent. The model was similar to that used 
for the licensing of recombinant DNA technology by Stanford University, the so-called Cohen-Boyer model. So as well as being an academic and an inventor, I'd now been blooded in licensing matters. As the technology was highly specialized, some of the companies taking out a license also requested advice in implementing the technology. And in fact, I agreed to consult for several companies, including Celtec, Unilever, Bering Verke, Amersham, and Scotchen. I think it was useful for them and it generated a nice consulting income for me for a year or two, but as expected, this really was only short term. But in the meantime, I gained some knowledge of how industry works. Two of the companies, uh, Celtec and Bering Verka, also wanted to collaborate on the early stages of development of humanized antibodies, and they funded research in my laboratory for this purpose. So in fact now I would become experienced in getting industry grants. I was also invited by ScotGen, a small biotechnology company based in the Department of Genetics at Aberdeen, to join their scientific advisory board. They were trying to develop a business of humanizing antibodies for industrial partners. The scientific advisory board used to meet up with senior management of the company and sometimes investors, so I began to get a feel of how startup companies work. The good news is that humanized antibodies did become big business. This is a recent slide of therapeutic antibodies approved by the FDA for marketing. What we see on the left hand side of the slide are those humanized antibodies that are generally used to treat inflammatory disorders. Um, on the right hand side, those, most of those are concerned with uh, treating cancer. And these are the two main applications that we saw um, antibodies in general used for. One of the key companies involved in doing this was Genentech. They made uh, several antibodies, of which uh, Avastin for the treatment of colorectal cancer and Herceptin for the treatment of breast cancer became multi-billion dollar drugs for many years. As part of this uh, commercialization strategy, the Medical Research Council also set up a collaborative center and engineered several successful humanized antibodies, Tysabri for multiple sclerosis and Actemra for rheumatoid arthritis under programs with their industrial partners. The MRC has received more than 500 million pounds in royalties over the years from humanized antibodies and used some of this to fund its independent medical charity, LifeArc. In the late 1980s, we hadn't known that humanized antibodies would be so successful. And I wondered whether we could find a way of making fully human antibodies. I don't have time to go into details, but it involved making a large and diverse combinatorial library of human antibodies and then selecting those that bound to antigen. In this slide, I've summarized the methods as were finally developed. So the idea was that we uh, took human lymphocytes, we used uh, the polymerase chain reaction to amplify the heavy and light chain genes from those lymphocytes. And then we shuffled the heavy and light chain genes from different lymphocytes to create a highly diverse uh, library of antibody genes. That library of antibody genes was then um, screened by inserting it into filamentous bacteriophage by cloning, as George Smith had for peptides, the antibody uh, uh, genes adjacent to the, uh, enter the N-terminal portion of the gene that encodes the uh, coat protein. So in that way, the uh, antibody fragments are displayed on the surface of the phage. So therefore we have phage, which have got antibodies on the outside um, and the corresponding antibody gene uh, wrapped up on the inside. 
and therefore it's possible to isolate the antibody genes of interest by seeing whether your phage binds to a, a antigen coated to a solid support. It's possible to get very high enrichment factors by uh, multiple rounds of selection. So you infect bacteria, you let those bacteria uh, uh, grow up, you would take the phage from those bacteria, you undertake selection on antigen, um, and then with the selected phage you get, of which some fraction should be binding to the target antigen, you can use those to infect further uh, bacteria and uh, grow up more phage, which you can enrich in the same way. And that way you can get multiple enrichment factors and find some very rare binders among uh, many phage that don't bind. I have to say the, the idea, although in many ways it's simple, was technically very demanding. And we became aware of competition from a consortium involving the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla and the company Stratagene. I needed both money and space, which were not available at that time from the Medical Research Council, and I therefore wondered whether I could find an industrial partner. Unfortunately, the other companies I was working with at this time weren't interested in getting involved in this new and rather speculative venture. So I wondered about setting up my own company and working with that. I got help from two sources, an old friend Geoffrey Grigg from Australia, who'd successfully set up his own company, Peptech, years earlier, and David Chiswell, the leader of an antibody engineering team from Amersham. Together with the blessing of the Medical Research Council, we set up Cambridge Antibody Technology. An investment from PEPTEC paid for a researcher, Dr John McCafferty, to work in my laboratory under a collaboration agreement. And it was he who made the breakthrough that we needed by showing that phage could be used to display antibody fragments. In due course, I became director of the company. So another two roles to add to my CV, founder and a company director. With its commercial partners, Cambridge Antibody Technology has been responsible for developing several human therapeutic antibodies, including Humira, which was approved in 2002 for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and is now one of the world's best-selling antibody drugs. This shows the action of Humira on plaque psoriasis. Um, Essentially, plaque psoriasis is an inflammatory, uh, inflammatory disease, and uh, the antibody Humira blocks the inflammatory mediator TNF. It's also used for, as I mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease and some other inflammatory diseases. This was the first human therapeutic antibody to be approved by the FDA. In this slide, I've listed all the human antibodies made by this approach that have been approved by the US FDA. Again, as we had with humanized antibodies, on the left, left hand side, I've put those antibodies uh, that, are, that are involved in um, uh, treatment of inflammatory disorders, and on the right hand side, those involved in treatment of cancer. You'll notice the list is rather smaller here. This probably reflects a number of um, um, aspects. Uh, I think the very wide licensing policy that was used for uh, humanized antibodies did have the effect that it spread the technology out there compared to this to this technology. But nevertheless, um, they were both successful methods. Cambridge Antibody uh, floated on the London Stock Exchange in 1997 and was bought by AstraZeneca in 2006 for 700 million pounds. To date, the Medical Research Council has made more than 150 million pounds in the sale of shares and royalties. Subsequently, I set up two other companies based on technology platforms. Demantis, 
to develop antibody single domains and bicycle therapeutics to develop small constrained peptides built onto a chemical core. Peptech was also a key investor in Demantis, together with the VC group, but Bicycle Therapeutics was it funded entirely by venture capitalists. As I gradually had more to do with venture capitalists, I found myself acting as an advisor to venture capital funds, and I currently advise two funds, Cambridge Innovation Capital and Aron Innovation Capital. So I found myself at different times moving in different worlds, mixing with academics, industrialists, stockbrokers, venture capitalists, and angel investors. I could also play different roles. At one moment I could be a ruthless entrepreneur and the next a highly principled research scientist. It's quite fun. The worlds of um, academic or clinical research are very different from the worlds of industry. Collaboration requires these worlds to share at least one important goal. Fortunately, getting new medicines to patients is a goal that we do share. Even with a common purpose, there are potential conflicts of interest in bridging academia and industry. For example, as a consultant, there's the danger you might reveal intellectual property and know-how that's owned by your institution. For this reason alone, you will need to deal with your technology transfer department. They can help you minimize conflicts by writing appropriate agreements. Let's assume that you've done some research that has practical implications and you now want to find an industrial partner. Firstly, consider developing a collaborative project. You start with the advantage that academia is often better at research than large companies in fact, it can make economic sense for a company to carry out research in academia, as subcontracting the research involves no long-term commitments to staff. Secondly, identify the companies already engaged in the area. Thirdly, present your work in industry meetings. Get yourself invited to talk at their external seminar programmes. Attend the sort of conferences where industry go. Hopefully the fish will bite. But let's suppose they don't. You might then want to look at the startup route. This route is more difficult, and you should ask yourself some questions. In the pharmaceutical industry, you might ask, how will your research ultimately be commercialized? What's going to be bought and sold? For example, will it be drugs or diagnostics or data? Where does the new company fit into the pharmaceutical ecosystem? Do you intend to make your own products or to sell product leads or to offer a service to others? What is the unique selling point of the new company? For example, which companies are already active in the area and how will you differentiate yourself? Will your ideas complement or compete with those of other companies? What's the market size and what share might you expect? That's a very difficult question, actually, if you expect to create a new market, but it's worth trying. What further research or development is necessary and what are its time scale and costs? Remember, if you can get money from grants, it's much cheaper than from venture capitalists. After you've run through such questions, you'll need to develop a business model and file patents as necessary to protect your business. Take advantage of a local business school. They often have students who need projects and they may help. Take advantage of any training on offer from your institution. Enter Dragon's Den competitions, or if you can't, sit in the audience and listen. This will at least provide feedback and give you the best chance of making a good impression. Try to prepare a brief presentation and a well-written one-page summary outlining your ideas and plans. It's harder to be brief and long-winded, but venture capitalists and other investors see a lot of proposals and it's important to make it easy for them. First impressions count. Now talk to venture capitalists or business angels. When you're ready, use contacts provided by your technology transfer department or senior colleagues. 
Accept that you will face rejection. Remember that venture capitalists are not charities. For them, money must not be wasted. When I set up Demantis with another research scientist, I asked him what was his motivation. He said, money, lots of it. I said, do you really want money that much? It's a huge amount of work and requires total commitment to uh, get involved in startup companies. And he said, I want money so much it hurts. When I mentioned this to the venture capitalists, they were electrified. Here was an academic they really understood and they invested promptly. I hope that if you take only one thing from this lecture, is it can be really exciting to translate research and to interact with industry. Finally, I wish you all the best of luck in becoming leaders of tomorrow.